I want to welcome you back to our second panel, which is on gender, sports, health, and wellness. And it's my real pleasure to introduce our moderator, Dr. Sherry Blauet, who I know from organizing uh, on the panel and who I, I knew already as a doctor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Harvard Medical School, my own hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and uh, Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital where she's a principal investigator for the Kelly Adaptive Sports Research Institute. What I didn't know until I read her biography just yesterday, that she also uh, has seven Paralympic medals and has won both the Boston and the New York marathons. Um, <laughs> Sherry has also addressed uh, the United Nations on behalf of um, athletes. So uh, please welcome me in welcoming Sherry. Thank you very much, Janet, and thanks everyone for returning for our second panel of the morning. Um, the focus of our session will be a bit of a deeper dive on the topic of gender, sports, health, and wellness. And I'd like to take a brief moment to um, encourage everyone on the back of your um, program is the social media. Um, handle the hashtag, et cetera, for today. So please feel free to be active on social media. We really want what we're doing here to get out in the broader public discourse via um, some of those outlets as well as via the webcast. So thanks for engaging in that way. So when we first initiated planning meetings to bring this conference together, it became very clear very quickly that topics related to health and medicine were some of the hottest topics that are out there in the public discourse, in the media, and what people are talking about. And we then realized that indeed, really health wellness is quite broadly defined when we think about the interaction of gender and sport. And it encompasses concepts like, you know, gender disparities in common sports injuries, like ACL tears and concussions, for example, both in terms of their incidence or how much they happen, but also how they're treated. So who ends up having surgery or not after an ACL tear and who returns to play after a concussion? And it's more likely that in this post-Title IX boom with over three million high school girls competing in sports, as was uh, noted this morning, that these topics are gonna become more and more important. Um, how we address treatment and, um, and issues related to sports injury according to gender is going to become even more important over time. It also encompasses the impact of gender on youth sport participation as a measure of wellness. Um, and you know, these days the childhood obesity rate can, is estimated at up to 30%. So when we think about how gender impacts things like implicit bias and unconscious perceptions of who we expect to be active, who do we expect to engage in physical activity and sport as a means of healthy lifestyles as they move into adulthood, um, we can see that, that that is a critical component of when we think about health and wellness. And last but not least in our elite athletes, how much is too much? And we know that athletes often feel the pressure to win at all costs, despite the potential for adverse health outcomes related to things like packed competition schedules, overtraining, and even when athletes are tempted to cross the line into use of performance enhancing substances and prohibited methods and, and, um, and uh, other mechanisms. So we're thrilled to host these three esteemed panelists to help us work through some of these challenging and very timely themes all related to health and wellness. And each of these three individuals really works at the intersection of what's going on in terms of how we're acting, interacting with athletes. Um, and I think we'll provide very interesting insights and perspectives on um, how we grapple with these issues and also the way forward into the future. So um, as with earlier in the morning, you'll note that the full biographies um, are in your, uh, in your uh, conference program. So just very briefly, I'll introduce our speakers. Dr. Brian Hainline is the Chief Medical Officer for the National Collegiate Athletic Association and also Clinical Professor of Neurology at the Indiana University School of Medicine at NYU. And I think Dr. Hainline provides a very amazing example of blending a clinical career with leadership and policy change. He's been active with the American Academy of Neurology Sports Section as well as the International Tennis Federation um, and with tennis more broadly um, as a sport for many years. Um, he also oversees the NCAA Sports Science Institute, so blending that, re, uh, that um, uh, issues of research um, as they impact athletes. So welcome, Dr. Hainline. Our next speaker will be Travis Tiger from the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, or USADA. 
And Travis is really at the helm of helping USADA carry out its mission of preserving integrity of competition, inspiring true sport, and protecting the rights of clean athletes. He's also been at the helm of many important investigations that have, of course, been very prominent um, in public and in the media, such as the Balco investigation, uh, the US Postal Service, Lance Armstrong, et cetera. Um, so under his leadership, USADA has really led the way and also been really involved in what happens at the grassroots level um, with the issues related to true sport and how we impart ethics in our young people as they uh, progress through their sports careers. So welcome, Travis. And our third speaker will, speaker will be Dr. Parissa Safai, who's an associate professor at the School of Kinesiology and Health Science and the Faculty of Health at York University in Toronto. And Parissa will really bring us a, a very unique and important lens for the morning as her research is focused on the sport at the intersection of risk, health, and health care, um, including topics such as the culture of risk, social determinants of athletes' health, and the impact of various inequalities related to gender, socioeconomic disparities, and ethnocultural issues um, on how we access physical activity and how these impact um, our society. So welcome, Dr. Safai. So without further ado, we'll begin our panel. And, and just a, a brief reminder on mechanics, we'll hear from each speaker for 15 minutes. We'll then open it up for um, intra-panel Q&A and a bit more discussion on some of the topics that come up. And then we'll open up for um, audience Q&A as well uh, prior to heading into lunch. So thank you very much. And uh, without further ado, we'll invite Dr. Henlein's comments. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sherry, and, and, and uh, thank you, everyone, for this great conference. And I'm really fired up just being here and listening. And it was a little difficult for me to prepare for this. It wasn't your typical medical talk. I had to really step outside of the box and think about what I was uh, going to say. And, so the first thing I did was a little bit of history checking, and I came up with this great photo. This is the Radcliffe crew team. It is the only uh, Harvard varsity sport team which carries the name Radcliffe and which wears the Radcliffe color. So, <laughs> so Radcliffe crew. Um, so I'm the chief medical officer of the NCAA, the first chief medical officer. I've been at this job for a little more than four years. The NCAA for those of you who don't know, is uh, the governing body of college varsity sports for 1,100 schools, 500,000 student athletes. We were formed in 1906. Really, it was President Roosevelt at the time who decided that we needed to have a governing body to really oversee football because there were 18 football deaths the year before and there was an existential crisis. So flash forward, 90% of my headaches for the 23 sports and 90 championships that we oversee is football. The NCAA is a membership-driven organization. It's bottom-up. So when we read in the newspaper, the NCAA didn't do this, the NCAA didn't do that, it's the membership. We are the opposite of top-down organizations such as the NFL and the Catholic Church. <laughs> I have uh, no disclosures. <laughs> Although I did go to Notre Dame, so... Um, there's a Catholic disclosure. Um, I'm going to just give a very, very brief overview of things that I believe are pertinent to the NCAA because, after all, that's my world. We won't take a deep dive into any of these. We really don't have the time. So let's look at participation rates. We've talked about this briefly. And we could look and say, wow, participation rates for women's sports have really been increasing considerably over the years. And yay Title IX and yay society, we're, we're, we're really getting our act together. And when we talk to the women who are in sport, they get a lot out of it. They really love being athletes. And it drives them for the rest of their life. And so it is a reason to truly celebrate. But we can look at these same statistics and say, well, is this a reason to celebrate or is this a reason to look at our barriers? Because, well, look at this. It, yes, there has been a great increase in women participation in sport, but also for all those naysayers of Title IX, look at the growth in men's sport. Title IX has done nothing to diminish that growth. And look at the more recent statistics about women in college compared to men, and they are the majority, but the statistics are more than reversed for women participation in college sports. So there is still a gap. There are barriers that still exist. I want to talk a little bit about one aspect of sport injury that we've heard a lot about, and that is concussion. And I will say very clearly, I've said this publicly on many occasions, concussion is the elephant in the room. But the single most important 
aspect of care that we need to address for our student athletes is mental health. The student athletes have told me that time and time again. And I visited over 100 schools, including Harvard, and I meet with the student athletes. This is their number one concern. But what about concussion? So we hear about concussion, we hear about football. And this is a, a study, it was actually published uh, just recently. And the rate of concussion is, is determined by athletic exposures. The highest risk sport for rate of concussion is men's wrestling. But look at the four women's sports that have virtually the same rate of concussion as men's football. Women's soccer, women's ice hockey, women's basketball, women's lacrosse. Now you should be shocked that women's lacrosse is there because the rules of women's lacrosse is that this is a non-contact sport. Well, what about concussion? For every single major aspect of health and safety, we must do a gap analysis. And the real gap analysis is that we don't even know the natural history of concussion. We have no idea what neurobiological recovery is in concussion. And we know very little about women who get concussed because 95% of the world literature on concussion is dominated by men's football and men's ice hockey. So when we have a gap analysis like that, we have to take action. We have to advocate. The NCAA partnered with the Department of Defense, and we have put together the largest prospective clinical longitudinal study ever done in the history of concussion. It's currently with 30 schools, and our recent data tell us that we've now analyzed over 30,000 athletes, we've tracked 2,000 concussions, and we're taking an exceptionally deep dive into several high contact risk sports, including women's ice hockey, women's soccer, women's lacrosse, where the athletes are wearing head accelerometers, they're getting genetic testing, blood biomarkers, genomics, and brain MRIs. So we are going to understand the neurobiology of concussion. I will say that of these 2,000 concussed athletes we've studied, 40% are women. A large study before that was 20. It's an exceptionally intense study. I won't go into the details of it, but the athletes are tested at baseline and then at subsequent intervals over six months. On average, most athletes return to play after a concussion by three weeks. If we sort that out, and this is not yet published data, has not been vetted in peer-reviewed literature, and by the way, in all the literature that is gonna come from this study, I will only be on the first two studies, the methodological studies. I will not be part of any of the data analysis, and these studies are being run independently by our member schools. But the athletes that return the quickest after a concussion are our contact sport athletes. I'm not gonna give you the why of that. We can talk about that, we can hypothesize about that, but it's the non-contact sport athletes that take the longest to return to play. And women in general are taking two days longer to play, to return to play after a concussion than men. I will tell you right off the bat, women concuss differently than men, neurophysiologically and biomechanically. That's just a fact. It's not a statement that's saying women and men do mathematics differently. It's saying that women concuss differently. And part of it in childbearing ages is because of the profound influence of estradiol, which prepares the woman every month to receive a fertilized egg. And that has a profound effect on what we call spreading waves of electrical depression in brain activity, which is one of the pathophysiologic mechanisms of migraine and also for prolonged concu concussion recovery. Women in general, also, they have more symptoms to report than men. These are just facts, and at some point, we are gonna take a deep dive into the why. Moving to sexual violence. The NCAA has put out, just recently, the Sexual Violence Prevention Toolkit. Every member of school has this toolkit. It has been endorsed by 12 higher education organizations, and our goal is to widely socialize this the Board of Governors, who is the highest ranking uh, committee for the NCAA made of 16 presidents, they just appointed a special commission to look deeper into this and to come up with policy that will be independent of Title IX and Cleary. Why? Because Cleary, as we know it, may be gone soon. Violence Against Women Act, as we know it, may be gone. Title IX may shift to the Department of Justice from the Department of Education. We must be actively prepared for the future, and we are addressing this with sexual violence. Looking at a recent study, 
uh, that looked over 25,000 uh, um, uh, uh, college uh, students. So the rate of sexual violence, even in one year, it varies from school to school, but it is still astoundingly high, up to 20% in some schools. And when we look at these college students and their lifetime incidents of sexual violence, it's astoundingly high. This is part of our society. This is humanity. This is homo sapiens. And when we look at those individuals and talk to those individuals who have been victims, they are much more likely to be hopeless, to be depressed, and to actually suffer with psychiatric conditions. And I'll just take a pause right now because I have treated thousands of victims of the most horrendous sexual and interpersonal violence ever. That was part of my subspecialty as a neurologist, working with Holocaust survivors, working with survivors of other profound violence. And when you talk to these individuals and you try to understand, you realize that free will, as we may hypothesize about it, as we may think metaphysically about it, it no longer exists. It doesn't exist at the moment of sexual violence and from every moment thereafter because it changes your physiology. It changes your perception of life. And unless there is a miraculous neurobiological reconciliation peacefully and almost with what we call unconditional love, your physiology is forever changed. Free will no longer exists. Moving to some lighter subjects, <laughs> anterior cruciate ligament tears, we know that females have a much <laughs> higher rate of ACL tears than males. Why? Well, there are a few reasons, but let's look at the societal reasons and the neurobiological reasons, because an ACL tear is not a mechanical issue. It's a neuromuscular maladaptive response. It is when you look at the women who are landing in their ready position, and if they're landing repetitively like this with poor neuromuscular control, that's a profound stress on the ACL. It is not the proper land like this. And when we have in our society people who are specializing in sport before the age of puberty, despite all of the data that it is the wrong thing to do, and then when you look at what happens at puberty and testosterone takes over in men, and that goes right to the muscles. It gives the men an advantage. And when you have someone who is highly specialized, who doesn't know how to land, who doesn't have testosterone receptors in their muscular system, and you have a repetitive maladaptive response, you have data like this. It is simply not acceptable. Now, we talked about tennis. I'm not going to go through all of these. But the tennis injury rates are similar. And I do agree, tennis is not perfect. But we should study tennis because it's pretty close to perfect. You go to the US Open Tennis Championships, and on any given day or night, we are paying equal amounts of money, and the women are getting equal amounts of pay for the single largest annual sporting event in the world. But I won't talk about tennis anymore. Other than that, when I visit every school, and I'm a former tennis player and I still compete, I always meet with the tennis team, and I tell them in silence, you know, behind closed doors, that yes, there are 23 NCAA sports, but tennis is definitely the greatest sport. <laughs> and what about what's happening since Title IX? Who's overseeing all of this? Who's overseeing the care of our women? Because it does make a difference. Pre-Title IX, when we looked at coaches, well, women's athletics were separate from men, so the vast, vast majority, close to 100% of coaches for women's teams were females. We've been stuck at about between 40, 45% for years. Does it make sense? Well, ask this question. Does it make sense that we've been stuck at this amount at this rate of athletic directors across the NCAA. We should be as complacent with this data as we are with the data of the number of females in the current President Trump's cabinet, <laughs> or with the number of females who have been President of the United States. We cannot be complacent with this data. The NCAA has recently sent out 
a presidential pledge. It has gone to the president of every one of the 1,100 NCA schools, and 75% have signed on to this to make a concerted effort to shift the gap for diversity, for gender, for all of the things that truly matter to us. So that's my brief, very brief overview of some uh, various aspects of uh, gender issues and, and, and sport. And I'm going to take another giant step back because I'm really listening very carefully. This first panel was nothing short of exceptional. And, and again, I, I really thank you from the bottom of my heart for allowing me to be here and, and to learn from you. So thank you. Well, thank you. It's, it's great to be here. I'm Travis Tigert of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. And just want to first thank um, Radcliffe Institute for the invitation to be here. Liz, Rebecca, Jessica, all your hard work in putting this together. It's truly an honor for me, and I'm, and I'm thrilled to be here. I guess the only um, exception to me being thrilled to be here is having to follow Brian Hainline, who um, <laughs> likewise, uh, compared to this morning's panel, gave a fantastic um, opening remarks to this, this session. also want to say thank you to Sherry, who's been a, a personal hero of mine and, and really took simply a phone call or it might have been an email from Sherry asking me to come and I said absolutely I'll be here. Anything for Sherry. And if you don't know Sherry, I'd strongly encourage you to get to know her. What she's done not only on the athletic field but off the field um, is just f flatly um, incredible and one of the role models that all of us should, should look to and, and honor. So Sherry, thank you for reaching out and having me here. So I'm going to dive right into it, and I heard, I think Donna said she speaks fast because people retain um, when you speak faster, and that's good news to me. I always um, assumed I spoke fast, mainly because I'm a middle child, and I assumed <laughs> at, at my house my parents never listened to me, um, and I never got what I asked for, so, so I'm glad to hear the research is called up, and I'll continue to speak as fast as I possibly can, and particularly given the short 15 minutes that we've got here um, in our opening um, remarks. Let me, let me just say at the United States Anti-Doping Agency, we are, we're not a government organization. We're a not-for-profit organization. We are recognized by Congress as the independent national anti-doping agency for Olympic, Paralympic, and Pan-American sports in the United States. We also do run some of the pro programs, UFC specifically, and happy to talk about that in the and the discussion if, if it's, if it's uh, relevant to any of you all. Uh, what is our job? We're here to protect the athlete's right. And you heard a little bit of a discussion on the first panel about privilege versus right. You know, we could get into the constitutional definitions under the 14th Amendment. I'm a lawyer by training. Whether or not it is a constitu constitutionally protected right here in the United States, you heard a need to talk about the right to work, laws that apply to athletes over in Europe. Bottom line, however you want to define right, it is a right. And athletes who agree to the rules, and, and let's remember, and this is a little bit of a philosophy major in me coming out, but sport is an agreement to a set of rules by the competitors and to agree to abide by the rules that all competitors have agreed to abide by. And in our world, anti-doping, when someone uses a prohibited substance, might be an anabolic steroid, might be human growth hormone, might be whatever the rule says is not allowed, that ultimately gives them a performance enhancing advantage under the rule, well, the person that they're competing against is harmed by that. Their rights under the rule aren't equally enforced. And they become, I think, in a lot of people's mind, a victim. There is a global set of rules that apply to all athletes in the Olympic movement. It's called the WADA code. This deals with the anti-doping question um, within you know, millions of athletes who compete on a daily basis, literally hundreds of sport organizations, with the exception of the pro sports here in the United States, with the exception of the NCAA, unless those athletes also compete within the Olympic movement. So the NBA Dream Team, for example, or now Redeem Team, that won you know, gold medal in 08 and, and 12, and again in 16, despite losing in, in 04, um, they are all held under the standards of our program that apply to athletes like Sherry, like Stephanie you heard earlier, that are day in and day out within the Olympic movement. But, but right in the preamble of the global rules, and, and by the way, relevant for a short video I'm going to show you at the end, 
There is also an international treaty that the United States government has signed, ratified as the Constitution requires by the Senate Foreign Relations Committee signed by President Bush at the time. Close to 200 other countries around the world have also signed that UNESCO treaty against doping in sport, including Russia. And that's uh, received a lot of headlines recently with the doping state, the state-run doping that uh, Russia um, has perpetuated on the world. And I'm gonna show you a short video of it, but I think it's also really important that there is an international treaty, there are sport rules that all define how the global stage for athletes is supposed to be conducted. So you, hear, you see right in the, the preamble, to protect athletes' fundamental right to participate in doping-free sport and thus promote health, safety, and equality. And I think that is at the heart of what USADA is here to do. We're simply the rules enforcer. While we have a big say in what the rules are, when it comes time to those rules being implemented here in the United States for our athletes, that's our job to ensure that they're evenly, fairly, and thoroughly and robustly enforced. He, listen, I, I can give you all the legal lease you want, show you the language right from the mouths of athletes. Here's a UNC Tar Heel grad, which I am. We're all very happy these days after Monday night. <laughs> but also a Marblehead Mass athlete who just last week and was confirmed again yesterday was upgraded from the bronze medal in the 08 Olympic Games to silver medal in the Olympic Games. Unfortunately, it was you know nine plus years later um, that she got wind of that. But you see her tweeting out, I think the sentiment that we hear from our athletes day in and day out, which is, you know, and, and good for her of putting her own interests aside and being willing to speak for others because there were other athletes who also got elevated and will receive medals that were taken by other athletes who doped at the time. And she says, I think very eloquently, I'm, I'm gutted for those athletes that had their stolen. So in addition to protecting our elite athletes within the Olympic Paralympic Pan Am movement here in the United States through testing, research, education, and results management, we also, um, from time to time, we're appropriate for our mission, embark on some research. And I think academics in the room, please go to our website. You can find this, What Sport Means in America, as well as a companion study, True Sport, What We Stand to Lose and Our Obsession to Win. I'm not gonna spend a bunch of time on it, but I think there's some really important findings. You know, sport, as I, I think you all probably agree, which is likely why you're here, you heard it from the first panel this morning, it, it touches um, our society and our communities like almost no other institution. Our research shows 162 million here in the United States, roughly you know, three-fifths of the population have some relationship to sport-related activities. Parents overwhelmingly cite personal and social values when describing their hopes for their children in playing sport. And I was really struck by Brian's statement about the mental health issue. And I think we have to ask ourselves the question, what lessons are our children you know, learning when they get to the elite level and Brian has access to them through their surveys at the NCAA? Well, what lessons are they learning? What factors are causing them at that level to have um, the mental health issues that they're so willingly apparently to, to describe. Coaches also rank as the number one influence on today's youth who are involved in sport. And listen, I've frequently said my children, um, daughter, two sons, all of whom play sports at the youth, youth level, they'll learn more watching um, the Broncos play and seeing Peyton Manning and how he acts off the field than they'll ever learn from me. But the reality is they're probably learning more from the coach that they spend a quite, amount, quite a bit of time with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and the fact that there's no national coaching accreditation, certification, you've seen some of the recent news on the sexual abuse, um, it just ha simply has to be dealt with in a more effective way. Two-thirds of America agrees that sport overemphasizes the importance of winning. And I have just two quick graphs um, and I know that might be tough to read, and I don't want you to try to read all of that in the short time that we have, but at, at the top, th this is a question from the survey that asks those that took the survey, and over 6,000 people, you know, it was done through an IRB, um, you know, robustly put together, what values as a participant in, in sport do you want to see? And, and I think it's, if you can see, that, so this is what people want out of sport. Okay, honesty, that's a value they want taught. Fair play, this is in order of 
importance to those that were surveyed. I think you see in, in the, you know, one of the main points is down here at the bottom, winning and competitiveness. And by no means am I saying we don't want to be competitive. We just have to be realistic about what are we willing to do in order to win. And this win at all costs culture is a, is a real live issue all the way down to our youth sports. So when you then ask the question, what is sport actually reinforcing? Not that it's completely turned on its head, but you see a pretty dramatic difference in what sport, at least what the perceptions are from parents and others who took this, were involved with this research. Um, competitive winning is at the top. And I think it's, it's no wonder we're seeing some of the manifestations of that culture, as Brian described. You also see a big drop off from kids playing sport at that 12 to 14 year old level um, because it's simply not fun anymore. And they don't like what they have to do, the specialization, the, the professionalization, and, and what they have to do in order to please the number one influence in their life, their coach, is just simply not fun for them anymore. We've tried to address it through a program, um, True Sport. I'd encourage you, if you're interested, please go and take a look at it. I think we would be remiss if we didn't at least acknowledge this issue. And I heard earlier um, about the head in the sand, I think, um, or the elephant in the room. We might describe this one as the head in the sand if we don't address it, because sport is addressing it. And I want to be really clear, these are not issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and I'm certainly not the expert on it, but I think this conference should examine these issues I think sport has to deal with it in a fair, objective way to ensure that all athletes' rights are protected in the way that they should be protected. You know, frankly, if you follow these cases, and they were you know, very popular in the headlines you know, in 2012 for the games, in 2016 for the games, I, I think um, you know, it should break all of our hearts to see how some of these individual athletes have been treated and humiliated. And, and I think we should all take steps to ensure best practices and policies are in place so that individual athletes don't have to go through the type of humiliation that some have had to go through. I, I think good for these athletes, frankly, for not backing down and being tough to push back on that potential humiliation and things that otherwise might cause people to cower away and, and truly be role models for us all. And, and listen, the, the, the rules are set by the sport federations I think it's fair to say they've done a very poor job in even attempting to get their arms around these issues. The IOC has put out a policy. Um, it passes or punts on the intersex question um, until sometime probably this summer. So I'd encourage you, if you're following these issues, to pay attention um, what ultimately will happen. On the gender question, whether a transitioning athlete um, can participate. Those rules are pretty well developed. The one area where that touches anti-doping is where you have, you know, a transitioning female who wants to um, compete, can compete as a man in, under the IOC policy. Frequently, that transition will require the use of testosterone, which, as I've said previously, is a, a violation potentially of the anti-doping rules. Fortunately, the anti-doping rules have a process to deal with that. We've had two cases where someone in a transitioning environment has a decision has come forward and disclosed and thus and since disclosure received permission to use that testosterone. So I think the anti-doping rules where it interfaces slightly deals with it directly um, in, a, in a well, um, in a very robust way, but happy to talk about that more as we can. Lastly, let me end with just a, a quick video um, and it may go one minute over. I, I'm not sure what the opportunity for women to compete in Russia is. Honestly, I don't know. It's a, it's a really fascinating question that I asked myself after hearing the first panel. Um, my guess is they don't have a, a Title IX type provision that gives the same opportunities that we have here in the United States. But thank goodness um, this particular woman competed in Russia and rose to the elite level ranks. Some of you may have heard this story, but it's the Russian whistleblower, female. She was named um, BBC most influential woman in the world, and I think you'll find her story compelling of what good women can do when they do participate. Let's see if we can get this to work. No, I don't think I'm a 
То есть я только рассказала ну, правду об этом для того, чтобы как-то с этим побороться. Я не считаю себя предателем. Очень хорошо помню момент, когда мне было 14 лет, и я смотрела по телевизору Олимпийские игры. В тот момент, когда поднимались наши российские спортсмены на пьедестал, я вместе с ними радовалась, и они плакали на пьедестале, и я с ними плакала. То есть я была очень горда за то, что ну, вот, российские спортсмены занимают э, первые места, выигрывают медали. Это, ну, не просто люди, это как боги. И зимой, в 2007 году, вот первый раз мне тренер сделал укол тестостерона. Да, я знала, что это запрещенные препараты, но также до того, как мне их дать, я думаю, тренер меня хорошо подготовил в том плане, что он мне рассказывал много историй о том, как... То есть получается как бы такой пинок, и тут, получается, у меня есть выбор. И у меня появляется второй шанс. То есть либо возвращаться в эту систему и просто ну, лгут и лгут, ничего страшного. Зато там, мне платят деньги, зато я там в сборной, зато меня на сборы возят. Либо же попробовать другой путь, правильный путь, который мой муж все эти три года пытался мне там, да, показать. Для меня было важно, чтобы человек подтвердил существование системы в России применения допинга. То есть, чтобы он сказал, да, там у нас в России вот все используют то, что руководство прикрывает, да, я об этом знаю, да, все об этом знают. То есть, вот это было для меня главное. Как моя жизнь складывается, то есть, как бы я там что не думала, Получается все совсем наоборот. То есть я никогда не могла себе представить, что я буду жить за границей, что я уеду из своего родного города, из своей страны. Ну да, тяжело слышать о том, что в твоей родной стране тебя считают предателем только потому, что ты хотел сделать что-то хорошее, только потому, что ты рассказал правду и надеялся на то, что... Incredible courage that this female competitor showed for the good of athletes around the world, including many here in the United States. Thank you for your attention. Good morning. I would like to first start by recognizing that we're gathered today on the traditional lands of a, a number of different indigenous communities and that I am uh, grateful for this opportunity to work on this land. I'd also like to add uh, my thanks to Dean Cohen and all the members of the planning committee for, um, first of all, this tremendous uh, event and for inviting me to be part of it. Now, um, we're going to go into a far different direction than what my co-panelists have um, initiated in this particular session, as I will be focusing on gender health and community or grassroots sport. I'm also, I think, representing the only representative of Canada here. So we'll be going international a little bit. Now, because I am the last panelist before lunch, I'm just gonna go straight to the key points here of my talk. Um, health is a political issue and a right of social citizenship. These are the key points that I will be coming through, through uh, throughout my entire talk. Two, that access to equitable community sport is an access to health issue and that the negative health consequences of inaccessible and inequitable community sport is far more substantial for vulnerable and marginalized uh, individuals and groups, in particular low-income girls and women. I suspect, I hope, that these points may seem obvious to most of us here, but if not, I will unpack each. In Canada, as in many other neoliberal regimes, 
preoccupations with individualized and behavioral approaches to disease prevention prevail, and they in fact act as barriers to more critical conversations about um, our health, despite the fact that there's a tremendous amount of evidence that um, uh, evidence of the social determinants of health. And a key question then becomes, how do we go uh, past our fixation on our waistlines? How do we go past these behavioral approaches to think more concretely about health and health care? Certainly, raising awareness of health as a political phenomenon is one um, approach. And to this end, Bambra et al.'s explication of the political nature of health is quite useful. Uh, these are folks from the UK. This is how they define the political nature of health. Health is political because some social groups have more of it than others. It's a resource that some enjoy more so than others. Its social determinants are amenable to political intervention and political action, more often than not political inaction. And health is political because the right to a standard of living and well-being is or should be a right of citizenship and a human right, something that was raised in the first uh, panel session in this conceptualization, health is not simply about our genetics or our lifestyles or our medical systems. It's not about uh, how long is the wait time for a particular procedure or who's going to pay for it. Those downstream type questions um, and the debates that they engender are critical, yes, but they also keep the priority on this very individualized and medicalized approach to health. Rather, this conceptualization here sees health as fundamentally linked to power and to the distribution of resources in our lives, as well as also to the quality of the social relations within our communities. And this third point clearly emphasizes that health is a right of social citizenship, which refers to a right of, uh, of us to share fully in life, to go beyond just economic welfare, but to be able to participate in life fulsomely and robustly. Whereas civil and political rights protect us from unwarranted interference from others, a person's social right of citizenship emphasizes equality, a sense of solidarity, and mutual dependency. So this emphasis on collectivity and community leads to my second point, that access to equitable community-based sport is an access to health issue. Let me offer you two very well-established facts. The first is that social cohesion and social connectedness, some of us may, may use the term social capital, it depends on, on us, but social cohesion, social connectedness has profound implication on our health. The greater our sense of connection with one another, the greater our sense of compassion for one another, the more we trust in one another and engage in one another, the healthier we are, the happier that we are. The World Health Report 2017 came out two weeks ago. The Scandinavian countries are back up at the top again, right? And why is that? Because, of, well, the Danes have a concept, they call it Hugo. I don't know if anyone's Danish here, forgive me for my Danish. Um, what it means, it translates to coziness, this element of coziness in their communities. That's one of the reasons why they rank at the top year after year. The reverse is true. The greater the sense of social isolation and social polarization, the greater our illness, the greater our injury and ill health. This is one of the core things that we're finding with regards to, let's say, the opioid crisis that's happening in the US and, and across Canada. The second fact is that when done well and equitably, community sport fosters social connectedness and belonging. I want to emphasize what I said there, when done well. In its best moments, community sport is a site where one can share fully in social life. It's inclusive and integrative. It is a resource that, when done well, can boost health, right? And so, therefore, access to community sport is an access to health issue. And yet the provision and delivery of community sport is more often than not quite disconnected from health and healthcare systems. In the city of Toronto, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, which is the division responsible for publicly funded, publicly accessible community sport, that which is available to Torontonians, it's completely separated from public health, the Department of Public Health. It's completely separated also from children's services, economic development and culture, equity, diversity and human rights, shelter, support and housing, social development, etc. In other words, in the siloization, which is a word, in the siloization of governance, community sport gets isolated into one department with very little dialogue or sustained conversation between these departments. 
This compartmentalization is matched by the too common relegation of community sport as just a frill or just fun and games for the kids. And this is, we hear this narrative by civic leaders, but also from community residents too. Outside of those occasions when a major sporting event is being hosted with all of the politics that happens in the fanfare, rarely is the provision and delivery of community sport discussed or debated with the same visibility and sustained sort of energy as let's say budgets, property taxes, police community relations, infrastructure troubles, or public transit. Of course, those issues are critical, but the near complete silence or the dismissal, outright dismissal of community sport as just not as important as whatever X, Y, Z is very problematic given its health consequences. This is particularly the case in this contemporary moment in time when public sectors are being hollowed out and when community sport programs are often the first to be sacrificed in the name of cost containment. Closing an outdoor hockey rink, uh, ice hockey rink, <laughs> uh, may seem the lesser of two evils when compared to cutting funding for community housing or public transit. But for the more vulnerable groups in our communities, those resources, community sport resources, are just as necessary and meaningful as shelter and transit. Why? Because they offer spaces and places to get beyond, even if just momentarily, the stark challenges of life. These are the spaces and places where people connect, where they get relief, stress, relief, where they have pleasure, where they attend to health and well-being. Then this leads to my third key point. The reduction of public services has impact on all of us, but has heightened consequence for those who are vulnerable. And low-income girls and women are one such vulnerable group. Even though the data that we have on sport participation, at least in Canada, is quite imprecise, there is consistent empirical evidence that the rate of participation among girls and women is consistently less than boys and men, and that the trend or the gap is more pronounced as you go up the um, socioeconomic ladder. Low or should go down, I should say. Low income girls and women disproportionately bear the burden of inaccessible community sport. While the fight for gender equality continues, sport still remains a school for masculinity and a majority of community resources still go to boys and men's sport, helping to reproduce the likelihood that boys are more likely to participate than girls. And this becomes even more complicated when we go back to the issue of the closure of community spaces and places like hockey rink, right? For families with the financial means, the loss of that neighborhood hockey rink can be managed, can be mitigated. They have the means with which to then get their sons and daughters into a private sport club, right? But for low-income families, the evidence suggests that once those community spaces are closed, it is the son's participation that gets more supported than the daughter's. Now, these are not cruel families. These are folks who are living in very precarious financial situations. And these are folks who more often than not have quite different ingrained perceptions about the value of sports for girls and women as compared to boys and men. In other words, even the meaning of sport participation is different as you travel down the social gradient. And to use the most Canadian of examples, we know that Canadian girls playing ice hockey, again, I come back to ice hockey. I was a rugby player, but I don't even know how to skate, but anyway. We know that Canadian girls who are playing ice hockey tend to come or tend to have parents who have higher ho uh, socioeconomic status. Not only um, do these parents have greater economic capital, but they tend to offer greater encouragement for their daughters to break out of traditional gender boundaries. For them, it is much more organic a thought that if my son can do it, my daughter can do it. What we know is that when you go to the other end of the socioeconomic spectrum, the meaningfulness of sport changes, as well as the exposure to, the competence in, and the access, right? And, and this is some information coming out of colleagues from the UK, Jay Coakley and Nita White. This is not just about children and youth. The hollowing out of the public sector contributes to the inaccessibility of community sport for women of all ages. This is a quote from a participant, a woman that I spoke to from a study I did a number of years ago, living in one of Toronto's high-risk neighborhoods, high-risk being code for very racialized, high number of immigrants, low socioeconomic status. She was from Sri Lanka, living in a high-rise department. The city of Toronto, because they needed to shrink the budget, decided that they wouldn't be shoveling the sidewalks as often when there was snowfall. And she said, when the city decides to no longer shovel the sidewalk around my building, how can my mother and I go for a daily walk when that's all I can afford? We're so good about preaching health promotion, you know? Be physically active, it's good for you, da-da-da-da-da. This woman knows physical activity is good for her. 
What this is, is commentary on some of the systemic barriers she's facing. Right? And if we had time to go into the complexities of gender, ethnicity, health, and community support, we would see the marking of racialized difference and otherness entwined with material conditions, such that struggles around a politics of identity cohere through processes as much economic as ethnocultural. Still to this day in Canada, it is recent women immigrant who are probably at the, the lowest levels of the socioeconomic ladder. Um, they are still, even though their education rates are, are higher, greater than ever because of Canada's immigration system, they are earning a fraction of what Canadian-born women um, are earning. And Canadian-born women are earning a fraction of what men are earning. Again, where does community sport fit into this? Now, I don't want to end my talk with doom and gloom because I'm just before lunch, right? Because there's also good news here. There are some incredibly innovative and thoughtful programs out there all across Canada, and I suspect across the US too, as well as other parts of the world, that are trying to prioritize accessibility and equity for low-income girls and women. So what are the common characteristics? I'm only going to highlight two. There's challenges. I can address that afterwards if anyone's interested. One is that they take into account a priori that low-income girls and women may have different prerequisites for participation, and they factor in those different participation prerequisites into the design and the delivery of the program. The other one is that they ensure that key individuals are at the decision-making table. They ensure representational access. Who are the key individuals? The low-income girls and women themselves. That they are there to inform how different programs get developed and then delivered. So for example, in uh, British Columbia a number of years ago, city officials, program developers, and academics from the University of British Columbia gathered together because they wanted to develop a program that would ameliorate the conditions for low-income girls and women living in some parts of the city, and it was a flop. They went to the girls and women in the community and they said, please come to the table. It was women, in fact, excuse me. And they said, please tell us, let us know what's going on. The women came to the decision-making table and said, we have children. Two things, we don't have money for childcare, and the other thing is, if our children can't find opportunities to play sport, we're not gonna engage in sport. The program revamped, and they developed free childcare for the women, free, child, uh, sport, free sport programs for the children, and it was a huge success. And the women said, you know, we know that we were socially isolated, we know this is gonna help us, and thank you for hearing our voices. In a Toronto-based program, it was in fact a group of Somalian recent immigrants, women, who came to the city. And they said, hey, city of Toronto, we want to engage in sport. By the way, we want to engage in field hockey. Why they chose field hockey, I don't know. They said, we will bring the women if you can attend to our participation prerequisites. We need a space where there's uh, security so that we can uh, learn, train, figure out for, uh, field hockey in private. And we need a female coach. City of Toronto said yes. So here we have bottom-up approaches. And what that ends up doing is it, it breaks a very vicious cycle. Most community support pro providers still believe that um, if you build it, they will come. So they develop a program that's not informed. It fails to take in the material conditions of these women's lives into account. The women don't participate. They then the program uh, officials blame the women for not taking advantage of the opportunity, and then some stereotypes keep getting reproduced. The apathetic poor person, or um, just the stigma of poverty, bottom-up approaches, get rid of this cycle. So let me leave you um, citing here Jane Jacobs from New York, but then transplanted to Toronto, so I claim her as Canadian. <laughs> but let me change her words a little bit. Community sports, have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created for everybody. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for, um, to our panelists for these uh, really insightful uh, remarks. And you know, I was talking to um, Parissa before our panel and I said, well, I hope we get some of those fist pump moments like the first panel had, where people in the audience are saying, yeah, this is a rights-based issue. And I think that what we've seen with this is that even when we talk about health wellness, even if it's something as concrete as a concussion, it's still a rights-based issue at the end of the day. Um, 
and it is a right to be able to participate and play sports safely and in a fair environment and to have access to identify as an athlete or someone who wants to live an active lifestyle, as, as uh, Dr. Safai so, um, so poignantly noted. So I'd like to open it up for some discussion now amongst the panel. And, um, and I'm going to kick it off with a question um, focusing on, I think that, that we realize when we talk about wellness, health, and medicine that, that very frequently we're quite reactive in our approach. So the, you know, the healthcare system here in the US is known to be very reactive. We're very good at treating disease when it happens, but we're very terrible, or we don't, we don't focus enough on prevention. So um, maybe we could talk a little bit about what we're doing in terms of prevention and how we're trying to move the needle on that, whether it's sports injuries or, or people being pressured for doping or thinking about being more proactive for communities. Well, I think we start by uh, understanding that sport is a microcosm of society. In the United States, 95% of our healthcare dollars are spent on treating disease and 5% is prevention. Mm -hmm. So that's one social issue. The other, I mentioned it briefly, is, is that we're not doing sport right at the youth level. Our, uh, even, you know, the girls are playing and, and traveling soccer leagues all year round. And, and, and we think that that's good and it's bad because we know that the way we're doing sport is leading to a 75% dropout rate at the age of puberty. So we have to really take a giant step back, but you, you know, I, I, I see, well, Nelson Mandela, I think, said it right. He said, you can measure a society by the way it treats sport. And um, the way we treat sport in the United States is that we've replaced the, uh, the one day of worship uh, in, in church with a day of worship on the football field. And, and, and that's a metaphor. And we have to, we have to acknowledge that. So I, I don't have, have the answer other than that. I, I, I believe so deeply in sport that I'm devoting my life to it. And, 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 and I think it is really an access to equal opportunity, but, but we're not doing it right at the youth level. Mm -hmm. And that's where it has to start. Mm -hmm. I have a bit of a different tack. Uh, <laughs> as an academic, as also a sociologist, I'm a little bit, I think more, I just, I'm gonna be more critical here. <laughs> so the challenge that we actually face with regards to this piece around prevention versus action is, is the fact that we don't have good data. We really just don't have great data. Um, I said already, I intimated in my presentation that when it comes to sport participation, the data that we have is really quite imprecise because the data is coming from who is playing, uh, how many people are tuned in and going through the turnstiles to get into the facilities or to get into the clubs. What we don't have great data on are the folks who are absolutely turned off of, of sport and, for, and why are they turned off of sport. The other challenge that we face too um, is that we also are really, we don't have very good information on the number of folks who are not necessarily interested in organized competitive sport, but who, I think about kids and girls, who will happily go into their room, lock the door, turn on the music and dance like there's no one watching <laughs> and are getting physical activity in that sense. So to come back to this question around prevention and, and action, it's a very challenging one because we don't have very good data. The other challenge is that there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of rhetoric about how sp sport is good for you. Um, and yet some of the data that we just saw today really puts a pause on that thinking, right? How good is sport for us? Uh, do we really want to dem democratize some of the highest levels of sport that we're seeing? I, I don't know. Uh, I played rugby for 20 years. It was powerfully transformative in my life. It was absolutely meaningful in so many ways, uh, contributed to who I am today. But I also have the body of a woman who played rugby for 20 years um, with all of the screws and the pins and all of that sort of stuff. Do we, is it part of our prevention strategy that we want to really support? I think there's some good thoughtful critical debates around that that need to happen. I may have gone on a tangent there, but. Yeah, I guess I would just say, um, and I don't disagree at all, Parissa, with what you just said. I mean, there's been many moments after sitting in long interviews with athletes who have succumbed to the temptation to dope where we, uh, myself and you know, an attorney or, or two, would walk out of the room and say, you know what, it's too bad we don't, um, you know, uh, aren't filming these to then show to parents because I think there are a lot of parents out there that never would want 
their son or daughter to be an elite level athlete if they have to go through the things that these athletes have had to go through and then make, you know, in our world, decisions um, that compromise the values that they were taught, um, couldn't look their parents in the face, kept secrets from their spouses to break the rules of sport just to gain an advantage. So, so I think there's some real truth to that that we certainly see at the ground level. From, uh, and just one topic, and I'll only mention it, um, you know, around this health question, and Brian, I think, actually, on one of our phone calls asked me to talk about supplements. But, but one area that's also a, a real live issue for us that I think is, you know, elite athletes are bombarded um, as are, I think, young athletes. You know, I, I saw um, supplement powder drinks being used at my daughter's 10-year-old swim meet um, a few years ago. And, you know, this is, a, this is an area where we have very poor regulation. Mm -hmm. um, some would argue there's no regulation on the dietary supplement market. Um, there is some legislation out there that attempts to control, but it's a, you know, 30-plus billion dollar industry, and eight to 10 billion of that is on this performance category. And, it's a pretty easy sell if you know you can have more energy and you can build bigger muscles and you can be faster and you can be better in bed and you can pay attention at conferences like this easier. Um, you know, it's a really easy sell and, and unfortunately, you know, there's there's not a whole lot um, to give good advice to athletes and, and they're risky. And what we tell our athletes, we've developed the website, um, Supplements 411. We pull supplements off store shelves and test them. And you know, there's been a prenatal vitamin that hasn't contained um, the amounts that it says on the labels and has contained significantly more amounts of certain vitamins that would be harmful at the levels that they're taking. And that's just, that's just one example. There's also you know, synthetic drugs um, and, and some of them as well that have caused athletes inadvertent positive tests that we have to deal with. So I, I think we, you know, having a captive audience in our 2,500 athletes that compete on a, you know, within the Olympic movement on a daily basis, attempt to do what we can do to address some of these issues. And, and supplements is one that's right in the crosshairs of us having to really give good advice to those athletes at that level to make informed decisions around it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so, and feel free to, to, you know, pipe in if you have other questions for one another, too. Um, one thing that I'm very curious about, um, we've seen recent commercials and, and media pieces focused on trying to change that, um, I guess you could say stigma or the bias that we have about, about particularly young girls being active. So there was a recent campaign about, you know, throw like a girl. What does it mean to throw like a girl? And, you know, I'm curious to hear whether you think, particularly you, Prissa, whether we're moving the needle on, on when we conceptualize and when we have that first thought of like, what are the differences between young men and women and whether or not um, our bias about about our expectations, you know, do we think it's changing at all with some of these mm -hmm. campaigns that are coming out? So the pragmatist in me uh, will be quick to say that any sort of campaign that at some level sort of seeks to boost girls and women's participation in sports, you know, should be applauded. The more critical scientist in me, though, is very quick to start to see some of the places where those are really quite limited. Um, there was a campaign, the Throw Like a Girl, a few years ago, they, they had the If You Let Me Play, right? Um, I wonder if some of you may remember that. The big challenge is what these types of campaigns is that they do nothing to actually destabilize the stereotypes that are faced by girls and women in sport. They're not about saying, whoa, what we say about girls and women in sport is false. It's not supported by any of the data, physiological all the way to social to cultural. It actually reproduces all of that. All it says is, well, let's just have more opportunities for girls and women to do it. And that's a disservice to girls and women, but also to boys and men. Mm -hmm. The reproduction of these stereotypes are just about what girls and women can do on the sporting field are just as damaging for boys and men who need to be seeing more and more sort of competent, capable women on the fields, off the fields, in the coaching uh, roles, in the administrative roles, and they're not seeing it. So again, it's a... Yay, more campaign, uh, campaigns, more commercials, excellent. But we need to be very sort of controlled with how much applause we give them. They're very, very, very double-edged in, 
potentially one piece, but not certainly not. Yeah. Yeah. The, and, and the fact that they reproduce these, uh, they're not destabilizing the boxes of sex and gender, right? They're not shifting them, even though in other areas they are being shifted. I think of, of what's happening in the, the transgender movement, right? And some of the, the very nuances that are being explored there. But those kinds of nuances are being supported in other spheres and not in sport. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. So um, we'll have time now to open it up to questions prior to lunch. So we have about 25 minutes. Um, and I invite everyone please to use the mic in the center of the room. Um, if you have a question, please introduce yourself um, and uh, try to be brief and, and be sure to keep it to a question and we'll get through as many as we can and, and use the wisdom on the panel here um, to the best of our ability. So yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Tori Clay. Um, before I make my comment, uh, I'd like to thank the unsung heroes here, the people in the back of the room, mm -hmm. because mm. I wear two hearing aids, and this is so rare for me to come to something like this and be able to hear every word. Yay. Really appreciate that. Um, obviously, I'm transgender female, and uh, when uh, Brian, you had that pledge up there. Uh, I just want you to know I have a little issue with it. I felt excluded because it said, um, it was a phrase, something like uh, racial and ethnic diversity, and then after gender was the word equality. And I'd much prefer gender diversity be included in that pledge. Yeah, so I, I think that's a, a, a fair point, and um, actually it's a point I'm going to bring back to the people who put together that pledge. So how the pledge came about is the, uh, the head of diversity and inclusion at the NCAA, and it's a staff initially written thing, and then the Board of Governors, uh, they have to approve that for it to become uh, open policy like that. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a, a, a very fair point. Um, I think another fair point is, um, and this isn't just because I'm part of the NCA, it's because I, I truly believe this. I think if you follow some of the politics of what's happened recently and because the NCA was unwavering in certain aspects, um, that we have seen some laws change, particularly in, in, in North Carolina, imperfectly, very imperfectly, mm -hmm. uh, because the, the standard was set at still a bar that many believe is unacceptable, but that's a standard that exists in um, a considerable number of states in this country. Mm -hmm. um, but with regard to uh, certain transgender issues, I, I, I think we are learning and we are trying to be a model. But your thank point's you. very well taken. Thank and uh, I'd like to thank the whole panel for uh, mentioning transgender and a lot of the things that you've mentioned it today. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Sam Batchelor. I, I have a, uh, a question about, particularly about performance enhancing drugs and uh, that the language around the, the use of them is always couched uh, or often couched in terms of fairness, uh, whereas it, it often really seems it's a matter of, of health or safety for, for the athletes. Uh, and that the uh, um, you know you're, you're basically asking athletes to choose between their their long term or even short term health and a higher performance level, uh, and I'm curious why you think that hasn't taken more hold and hasn't uh, you know been pitched or even uh, championed more more by athletes uh, as an issue of safety as opposed to an issue of fairness. Yeah, well, thanks thanks for your question, Sam. You know, uh, listen, I think. First of all, for a particular substance or method, so a transfusion or an IV, whatever the case may be, that's prohibited, there, it has to meet two of three criteria. One is it enhances performance or has the potential to, to it violates health or safety of the individual athlete taking it, but there's also a concern in some of the Supreme Court cases have dealt with when you have you know, a, a high um, football player, let's say, on cocaine, their more reckless inhibitions are 
down, they might cause injury to other people that they're competing against. So there's kind of a, a, a double facet there from a health and safety standpoint. And then this more nebulous spirit of sport. Um, I, you know, I think, I think part of the problem is young athletes, and some of you will remember there was a Sports Illustrated study that was done. I think it's since been refuted as not, you know, credible, but the point uh, ex you know, the exaggerated point makes the, the point, I think, is the biggest hurdle in getting athletes to recognize this issue is, you know, they said if you could win a gold medal, uh, take a drug, not get caught, win a gold medal, but die within five years, I think, um, you may remember the study, and, you know, a majority of the people said, yeah, they would do it. So I think you're dealing with a population of young athletes who, you know, really aren't feel fearful of something bad happened to their health, and if they can get a short-term glory, maybe it leads it translates into millions of dollars and they can take care of their family. They're not necessarily thinking ahead, you know, a few years too. But I think you also, that, that said, I think you're also seeing um, a generation of athletes um, who are coming off the field who have participated in the era where these synthetic pharmaceutical drugs have flooded the market like we've never seen before in a very concentrated time period. And, and I think you have to look at some of the injuries that these players, you know, in their 40s, 50s, and 60s are, are now suffering from if they're still around. And, and let's have a candid conversation about what, what else, other than the contact of the game, for example, is causing some of these um, injuries. And very many of them seem to be you know, uh, textbook classic side effects of the abuse of androgenic anabolic steroids, for example. So I, I think we'll see an ongoing discussion about those, those very issues. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Kiri Healy. I appreciate you mentioning um, North Carolina. I am currently working at Duke. And I would also like to point out, as a rival to tennis, that roller derby uh, is a fast-growing sport for both men, women, and children. And it's played co-ed at many levels, though not at the elite level. Um, for the policies and for um, testosterone as a kind of doping or potentially as a kind of doping as a performance-enhancing drug, I would like to encourage you to study sports outside of the ones that are legitimized by the NCAA and the Olympics and look at sports that in fact have gender policies that are quite broad. For example, the Women's Flat Track Derby Association, if you identify as a woman or you are gender expansive, you may skate. For the Men's <coughs> Derby Association, their policy is uh, we do not interfere in the privacy of skaters. Their presence on the track is enough to say they can skate with the men's team. Same for junior derby, which is co-ed, all the way from seven to 17. Boys and girls play together, and there are adolescents who are transitioning from one way or the other or are considered gender expansive. So if you would like to inform yourselves regarding um, gender expansive skaters, skaters in transition, athletes in a full contact sport that play co-ed at many levels of the game, I recommend that you look at that sport. Thank yeah, thanks. <laughs> you, you, I'll, I'll just comment. I, I, uh, I think we've seen, so I don't know sport very well out, outside of the, this, this country, but I'm exceptionally data-driven when I, when I look at things. And um, sport has been transformative uh, in terms of opening up opportunities at some level uh, racially and, and uh, uh, for, for, for women participation. I think where we are really missing the greatest opportunity and if we look at the data, we understand this, is that there is a phenomenal uh, segregation of sport from uh, our, our public high schools and public grade schools in this country. It's phenomenal. And it actually is uh, cited as one of the five most important reasons why there is sport dropout. And we can argue whether sport is good or bad, but the data are unequivocal as well, at least from the NCAA, that those who participate in sport, and we do quality of life studies 10, 20, 30 years later, and even when we look at the mental health aspects in college, sport offers something that non-sport does not. And, and that's just looking at sport, not exercise. I think we have to get a better dive into exercise. But at the grade school level, there is an exceptional opportunity to break all of the barriers with equal participation. And the greatest thing that I saw, and there are pretty good data on this in New York City, it was uh, when a single uh, person brought ballroom dancing into New York City public schools and then expanded it to, I think, over 50,000 kids who were participating. And, and you track these kids and they become dancers for life. But more importantly, 
they learn how to interact together at the most profound level. They learn how to touch one another and to lead and to follow. And, and so we need more examples like this, but it's not, in this country, it's not happening at the grade school level where it must start. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hello, my name is Connor, and I'm a senior at Tufts University. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys a question about something that wasn't really brought up on the panel, and I was kind of surprised about that. Um, how do you feel that eating disorder is impacting um, women and um, men as well? Um, and how is that being combated at the higher up level? Do you want to start? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so the, just to be clear, you want to know about high performance sport. And, and so uh, from a research perspective, and I don't specialize in the area, or I don't do a great deal of research in the area of eating disorders. But what we do know is that yes, the higher up you move up the competitive sporting ladder, the greater tolerance for just what's called as shorthand in the sociology of sport, the culture of risk, which is more specifically about tolerance for health compromising behaviors, um, including eating disorders or excessive exercise. Part of that is part of the part and parcel of what it means to be high performance athletes, folks who are putting in 40, 50 hours to train, let alone get ready for competitions. Um, uh, how is it being managed? I can't speak with confidence, but if I may throw a little bit of a spanner into the works, a different way of thinking about it. I do do research looking at poverty amongst high performance athletes. And one of the uh, repeated messages I hear from athletes, uh, most of whom are living below the poverty line, it's very, they are, the exceptional ones are the ones with the sponsorship, with the commercials, et cetera. Most of them are actually really quite impoverished. Um, and it's almost like forced um, starvation. I've spoken to many athletes who speak about uh, many nights having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and that's the only meal that they can afford. It's not what you've asked, uh, but it is a different way of thinking about uh, some of the determinants of, of very dangerous sort of health compromising behaviors and practices. But maybe Brian can speak with greater confidence about your, your question. Yeah, so it was really the... Eating disorders, disordered eating, like female athletes and disordered eating. And like, you know, it being an issue with regards to for the athletes, so competitive athletes. Yeah. So, so just so because I'm not sure I, I completely understood. So the competitive athletes at the elite level, the 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 question is, for um, just what has been done at the higher up level to kind of look into this and how um, it's being reconciled. Just like yeah, how much research has been it's done. It's not. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't be laughing. I apologize. It's so, if, yeah, at the highest level, so addressing, say, the female athlete triad is so the. I think the International Olympic Committee took a great lead in that when they what what they do is they, uh, and Travis and I were talking about this beforehand. They they organize these. Uh, uh, two or three day symposium where they address an issue. So they address an issue, female athlete triad, and it, and it spun into a differentiation of female athlete triad and energy deficiency. And, and saying that those are really, it might be a continuum, but there are two separate issues. So energy deficiency means you're simply not getting the energy requirements for what you need. And, and we see that that is very high in sports that are uh, uh, where, where there's a certain uniform that's worn. And, and, and so like in men's wrestling or in women's swimming, women's track and field. Uh, and, and, and so that's one aspect. Energy deficiency does not mean that you move to female athlete triad per se, which, which is the combination of, of not menstruating and having an eating disorder and, 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 and bone loss. And, and that has a much higher morbidity and even mortality rate to it. Um, I think the ILC took the lead in trying to then educate the entire sports body about that. I can just say we're, we're trying to do that at the NCA level. But here's the block, and, and Travis actually, I, I think, insightfully made a comment that we, we, we must understand, because the block is happening at the coaching level. Mm -hmm. The coaches say, this is what you must look like, this is what you must do. And the United States of America, as great as we may be, to be a coach, all you have to do is hold up a shingle and say, I'm a coach. In Europe, you are required to take hundreds of hours of, 
of, of in-class and experiential learning. So now there are, are some governing bodies that are moving to requiring a master's level certification. And I'll speak out because tennis just uh, started USTAU. But there are others. I just had a meeting last week with the PGA Tour and they're thinking of doing the same thing. Wrestling is thinking of doing the same thing. We have to have a movement in this country where if you're going to be a coach, you must understand what it means to be a coach. You must understand the sports sciences. And we are so far away from that that it's, it's dangerous. And that gets to the level of, so how do we influence our athletes about the female athlete triad and eating disorders when Travis also said the number one influence on athletes is the coach? There's the disconnect. Yeah. And, and I'll add briefly as well, I think that... I certainly know, um, you know, from transitioning in my role as an athlete to now uh, practicing sport medicine, that there's certainly been an evolution um, in the recognition of eating disorders and and that evolving into concepts like the female athlete triad or what the IOC um, titled energy de relative energy deficiency in sport. And uh, there's it, it's better than it used to be in terms of relative awareness of the fact that that as an entity is just as dangerous as some of the other things that we did describe, like concussion and ACL tears. It's yet another um, uh, health-related issue that does show some um, propensity towards impacting female athletes disproportionately, although it does impact males as well. Um, and we just have a lot more work to do um, to educate athletes, the entire entourage, as well as even our colleagues in, this, in the medical community. Um, we are doing a, uh, trying to kick off some work on looking at um, these issues, the female athlete triad, et cetera, in Paralympic athletes, for example, where there's nothing known currently. So it's in very much an evolving area, and I appreciate, that was a great question. <laughs> I just say, just real quick, uh, so clearly not enough is being done, and I, and I think we have to be realistic about why some of these issues aren't being addressed by athletic programs, whether it's in the college setting, whether it's by international federations, because it, it cuts against the money that could be used to, to win, quite, quite frankly, and I think we just have to be realistic about that. From an enforcement standpoint, which is where I come from, I'm not a sport organization, we're independent of sport organizations. I, I, I think we see a couple disturbing trends, that one clearly, clearly being one um, of those trends that we see, particularly where you know, prohibited substances or supplements might be introduced to help combat or you know, provide the nutritional needs that someone otherwise needs. Um, also, what we're seeing is this abuse of non-prohibited, so there are drugs that are allowed to be used in sport, like tramadol, for example, like thyroxine, for example. Thyroxine, a classic one that can be used for weight loss, where someone doesn't have, um, you know, at least under our U.S. medical guidelines and particular state guidelines, reason enough to use them. They're abusing them, in fact, for sport performance, and there's serious questions around health. It, it falls outside of our enforcement jurisdiction. Some sports have put in um, code of conduct violations that might capture some of those pressures that are being put on athletes to starve themselves or abuse prescription medications for performance purposes. I think the U.S. is in the process and has just, um, there's a, a bill pending in, in Congress, the Feinstein bill on, on the U.S. Center for Safe Sport, the USOC has announced it. Um, opening earlier this month or maybe uh, March 1st, I think. And it's going to deal with, th from an enforcement standpoint, things like bullying, harassment, sexual abuse. And we'll see where some of these trends that we're seeing that aren't in our jurisdiction from an enforcement standpoint end up being covered because they, they have to be dealt with in an effective fashion to protect athletes. If we truly care about athletes, we health and safety and fairness, we, we have to deal with these in a more effective way. Yeah. Thank you. That was Thank really you. great from all the different perspectives. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Hi, um, my name is Annie Brown. I'm an alum of Harvard College and the Radcliffe rugby team. Um, and I also had my third ACL reconstruction at the age of 19. So I was particularly interested in some of the data you were showing about um, like sort of biomechanical injuries for girls and whether your sense of the solution to that is just that girls aren't getting access and support to go to strength and conditioning, kind of lateral movement, that sort of coaching, or whether there's actual kind of female specific programs that need to be researched further and developed that like treat women's mechanics differently? Well, great question. Um, so we're in the middle of actually our first round of data analysis of 30 million data points. And um, 
the articles are probably going to be coming out, uh, the more definitive ones, in about a year from now. But a, a couple of uh, uh, highlights. So if we look at soccer, um, the, the biggest concussion risk in soccer is actually in the act of heading. But for men, it's head to head and elbow to head. For women, it's head to ground. In ice hockey, the biggest, uh, uh, the singular event that causes more concussion in women ice hockey than men is head to ice. And ice is more unforgiving than concrete. For men, it's head to board and elbow to head. So something fundamentally different is happening. Also, if we analyze soccer, uh, and, and, and we must think this way, and I mentioned testosterone, and, and you, you, you know, so, so, so it, it, it shifts your, even your ability for scapular thoracic control. And if you analyze how, how young women head the ball, it's more often up here, whereas men, young men, are heading the ball properly here. When you are heading the ball up here, you have a sudden rotational force that you should not have. Now, we don't understand all of the biomechanics of that yet, so I think we're early on, and, and, and we are actually putting sensors in, in, in a, a large number of, of, of individuals that are playing soccer, and I think we'll have that data um, in, in two years. But, but the most important thing I can say is that fundamentally concussions in women has been ignored, largely, and, and this study is, is, is addressing that. We, we have, um, you know, I think 800 concussion in women that we are studying um, in great detail. But, but the final thing I'll say is I'm not certain concussion is the right metric. It may be repetitive head impact exposure. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be mindful of that as well. My name is Vicky. I'm a freshman at the college. I had a question about transitioning from like playing a sport for fun into like in an elite level. You mentioned how like it's bad to specialize, but I feel like when you do like ultimately if your goal is to play for the Olympics or to like play for varsity college, if you look at like like my friends who are on varsity teams, you have to start at a young level in order to be able to compete at that level. And I was wondering, it could be wrong, but it's like for a lot of students, you do have to start young. And I was wondering, like, in terms of addressing this issue, in terms of, I guess, not specializing, are, you supposed, are we supposed to change the whole way we view sports in terms of winning competitiveness? Um, and I feel like, because the thing is, this whole body of like the Olympics, it's like, why do people compete? And then it's like you compare countries by like how many medals you have, which is like defined by winning. And then I think it just trickles down to like you have to start playing a sport when you're really young and specializing in order to ultimately reach that level. And like how, what are the ways to address this? So, so it's a great <laughs> question. Again, being data driven, if you look at the Olympic medalists, most of them were multi-sport. And so there's a difference between, and, 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 and there's a, a, a great uh, um, American football coach at Ohio State, and, um, and he said, how does he determine who he chooses as athletes? The number one thing he looks at first is those that played five sports or more. So that's Urban Meyer. But let's go to the fundamental question. There's a difference between early initiation and early specialization. And if you want to be an Olympic athlete, there's no question. You have to initiate in sport at a young age. But playing multiple sports allows you to develop what's called athleticism as opposed to being a player. So look at data again if you wanted to be a great baseball player. And you look at ESPN Little League World Series over the last 30 years and track every single one of the pitchers at age 12. They all had beards. They were all throwing 100-mile-an-hour fastballs. <laughs> and they were winning the World Series at age 12. Not one has pitched in Major League Baseball on a regular basis. So that's the, the development of a player at a young age versus an athlete. And USA Basketball just came out with an, an, an exceptional an exceptional document on how you can become an elite-level basketball player. It's early initiation but you don't start totally specializing until you are really beyond the age of puberty. So that's the American development model as well, and, and, and 40, all 47 uh, uh, NBGs in, in this country have signed on to it. But we just haven't gotten beyond the hype and the craze of the parents who, you, you know, and the kids who think they have to specialize at a young age. The data don't support that. That's right. Thank you. Okay, I think we need to wrap up. Um, so I want to thank our panelists for a fantastic discussion. Many thanks to the audience. They're really great questions, great discussion. Oh, yeah, yeah.